Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is our third installment of our Summer of Learning webinar series. And uh, we appreciate everybody joining us today. Today we have Adam Soder here, uh, our resident professor. Um, we have gone through two sessions so far. We've kind of, as we've, as we've told you, and, and if you've been with us along the way, uh, we started from kind of a foundational level. Uh, we talked about uh, the PT fundamentals, uh, basics like power, force, work, uh, even into ratio and geared types. And then our second session, we came in with uh, gearbox selection and pre-install checklist. So Adam walked us through the selection process and then what to look for when you actually order your gearbox and making sure you got the right gearbox. So today we're taking that next step and Adam is going to walk us through the uh, installation process. And he's gonna talk about a few different types of installations, what to look for to make sure that your gearbox will run optimally. Again, this whole series is, is, uh, is geared towards asset optimization and really, the total cost of ownership. So trying to reduce the total cost of ownership. Um, so before I turn it over to Adam, just, a, just a, a quick introduction here in case you haven't been with us. Adam has been here now for 11 years. Mm -hmm. Adam is our product system reliability manager. He's held various titles through, throughout his years here uh, from application engineer to project engineer. And he's done a lot of field work and really been instrumental in the condition monitoring and asset optimization. So he's the right one to talk to you about uh, total cost of ownership and asset optimization. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Adam and I'm gonna step off to the side for this one, probably give Adam a hand with uh, <clears throat> some of the, the videography here. So uh, Adam, take All right. away. Thank you very much, Phil. All right, so as Phil mentioned last week, last couple of sessions, we've gone through the selection process. So we know our gearbox is the correct one for our application. We know how big it should be, how much horsepower we needed. We're meeting the demands of our application. Now it's time to install it. You have it ordered, it's on site, let's install it. So let's start off with some things we wanna consider for what it's mounting to. So we have our little demo rig here. Some of the things you, that you wanna look at is what it's mounting to. So for example, this one is what we call a base mounted. So it's mounted to a solid base. The base itself needs to be uh, completely flat. Obviously you always wanna be as flat as possible. Yeah, a machine base is preferred, meaning you're machining it completely flat that all the uh, surfaces are parallel to each other, even with each other to make sure the the box, the reducer, whatever reducer is, this style, larger, whatever the case may be, you wanna make sure it's completely sitting flat on the base you're mounting to. Now, for whatever reason, if, the, if, the, if it's a retrofit application where the gearbox wasn't uh, designed specifically for the base or the base wasn't designed for that gearbox and you need to make it work, a shim like this uh, would be perfectly acceptable to shove underneath the gearbox and take out any rock or any um, miss or unsquareness between the mounting base and the base of the reducer itself. So one of these shims can come in handy or a couple, whatever you have to do to keep from a situation we call soft foot, meaning one of the feet or the uh, mounting positions or mounting locations is soft and it could rock. So you want to avoid any rocking. If it is rocking, if you don't realize it, if you don't check for it, what happens is you can pre-tension the housing and longer term, you could physically break the housing because if the torque is pulling it one direction, it's allowed to move because the base is not flat, it'll eventually break that housing. So we know our mounting base is good. So now we can just mount it up there. So we have this bolted down, we're good to go. A couple other things to check. We mentioned this last week with the rotation direction. So you want to, uh, Make sure it's turning the way you want it to turn. So if we were to turn our input shaft here, the, op the output shaft turns, we can see which direction it's going. That's the direction we want it to go. We're good. Same thing when you wire the motor up. You wire the motor up, give it a quick test, make sure it turns the direction you're going or you want the application to go. If it doesn't, you need to change your, the wiring direction, the wiring pins to change the direction of the motor. So quick things like that to make sure nothing is damaged from things going the wrong direction. Uh, from there, safety guards, 
We always want to make sure our safety guards are properly installed once everything is confirmed. And uh, that way, if nothing can get in here like this. You don't want this to happen when it's turning, things like that. Guards are installed. Next would be the breather. Next and probably last on the gearbox would be the breather. You, in most cases, you have to remove a plug. Uh, we ship them, us personally, we ship them empty. You can ship it uh, with oil, but that all depends on your preference. But if it's empty, put the correct oil in it. Make sure you're at the correct oil level. Uh, make sure the, the drain plug is in. Obviously, you don't want it to drain right back out. But once everything is confirmed, you put your breather in, your reducer is ready to go. Now, other things to consider, depending on your application. Now, this is just a simple chain and sprocket set up here. Um, we're going to go through a couple things to check for chain and sprocket. So, Phil, if you want to get a quick angle over here, things you want to make sure is your chain and sprocket alignment. So a quick, quick check, you just take a straight edge here, and you want to touch four points on the two sprockets that you're aligning. Now, if you look close here, there's not four points touching. So when I say four points, you want one, two, three, four. Now, if you can see, the gap right here is much too large. So for demonstration purposes, we're gonna leave this alone, but ideally you would wanna adjust your shaft here to make sure that this looked more like this on both sprockets. What happens there, if you don't correct that, you'll get premature wear of your sprocket, you'll get premature wear of your chain, and it could be very noisy on the chain depending on the speed that you're running. So for, for this purpose, we're gonna leave it out as you saw, as you see it's way, it's pretty far out right here. So we know it's not aligned, but that's where you wanna check that. So we'll go ahead and put this chain on real fast. So now, now you can see that chain is definitely too loose. So the way we check that, again, using the same straight edge, you put it across the top and the rule of thumb here, you can probably get from that side there. The rule of thumb here is you want for every inch of center distance, so center, difference from, center distance from each shaft, you want a 16th of an inch of deflection down. So obviously this is way too much. So what we'll do, we'll come over here and we'll tighten this up. And if you watch here, you can see our tension going much further. So I'll be tightening it up a little bit. So we essentially move this down this way to get tighter chain tension and we'll check it again here. So we'll go across the top, we'll give it a little bit and we're about 16 inches here and that's enough deflection for that chain. You want a little bit, if it's too tight, what's gonna happen if it's too tight, you're gonna pull too much preload or too much overhung load on this reducer. So when you have too much overhung load on the reducer, you're gonna get premature seal failure on the reducer first, then eventually the bearings will fail as well. They'll get loud and they'll start to fail. Because what it's doing is it's taking the shaft inside here and twisting it. This is dramatic, it's, you're never gonna see it this much, but you will twist it this much and preload everything inside there causing damage. So you definitely don't want this to be too tight and you wanna make sure, well, like we talked about, uh, in the selection process, this is accounted for in the selection. If you know there's a, a, if it's a much bigger chain, this is considered a single roller. If there's a double or triple roller, the amount of load that it sees is much more than that. So we wanna make sure that we're compensating in the selection process as we talked about last time. So now we know our chain's good, it's the right tension. We can come over here, we can start it. Now we know our application's good to go. So when, it's, when you first do the initial startup, Obviously, you're going to listen for anything out of the ordinary. So noises, clunking, grinding. Uh, you're going to take, just feel it with your hand, obviously, before it gets too hot. You're going to just make sure nothing's out of the ordinary. Keep an eye on it. Get, let it go through a few heat cycles. Make sure uh, nothing changes over time when it's running. Uh, if it does, start over again. Double check all your installation settings, your installation parameters your speeds, make sure the, the motor is tight to the reducer, make sure the reducer is tight to the mounting base, et cetera. You just wanna double check. But once it's up and running, you're good to go. Now, all this depends on your application. If it's a start and stop application, things might move around. You wanna check it a little bit more frequently, but if it's a constant run application, you can check it a little bit less frequently because the shocking isn't there, but it's all considering on your application. So I'll go ahead and stop this. Hey, Adam, I just want to ask a couple of sure. questions here. Um, usually I'm on camera for this, but I'm off camera. <laughs> so, He's over here. Uh, yeah. 
the the safety guard we didn't have that installed but just want to make sure I, I reiterate that when you're running these things correct gotta have that safety guard on there right correct yes you want to make sure that's mounted on there anything where you can stick your finger in or if a tool falls in or if you have longer hair hair can wrap around you definitely want to make sure your guard same thing with the chain here normally this would be completely covered with a chain guard perfect and then we, we had a couple questions so yeah sure we can uh, jump in real quick I'd, before I'd we move throw on. them in yep. there yep sure. and and just for anyone on the line as well if you've got a question please feel free to post it in the chat uh we have a q a uh feature so if, if you got anything anytime along the way please feel free to post it but all right uh, sure. one okay. question was are there any tips for aligning the coupling uh lining the input coupling so the coupling we have here is this adapter this is our nema c face adapter what NEMA C-Face means, NEMA is a, a standards organization that does all these dimensions. So all NEMA adapters will match, all NEMA motors, excuse me, will match a NEMA designed adapter. If this adapter is made for this NEMA motor, it's made, it will always bolt right up, no questions asked. Whoever makes it, doesn't matter. But for aligning this with this type of adapter, there really is no alignment. You're literally bolting these holes in, the way these are machined, the centers are, they're concentric on both sides. So the, our input shaft center and our motor shaft center are exactly perfect and there is no alignment. The only thing you have to make sure, which I don't know if you'll be able to see it close enough is make sure the coupling half. So there's two halves here, I can do it this way. This is just a bigger version of this one. Just make sure the coupling halves are completely into each other all the way. If they're not, they tend to be like this, they could break out, they could, um, break away, destroy that, it, what we call that spider. We pull that apart. This coupling spider here. If they're not in all the way, this would get destroyed. This is just a rubber membrane that would get destroyed. So you just have to make sure that they're all the way together like that. The alignment isn't that crucial on this side. Now, if it's on an output coupling, that's a different story. Same concept there. Uh, usually we use a laser aligner. If we, if we take this piece of shaft here, if we had one, if we had the coupling half on one side and then the other shaft had the other coupling half, you put a laser aligner here and a laser aligner on this shaft and make sure they're aligned that way for both uh, left and right alignment, up, down, in and out, similar like that. Gotcha. But there is a tool for that job. Okay, perfect. And then one of the other questions was, uh, should we use any C shaft? And if so, when? Uh, we'll cover that in a little bit when we okay. do a keyed hollow bore perfect. shaft. There is certain situations where you do want to use NACs, but there's definitely certain situations where you do not want to use antifreeze. Um, uh, for, I don't know if we can switch to this camera real quick. This type of coupling here, this is a quick, this quick QD bushing it's referred to, a quick disconnect bushing. You definitely don't want to use NACs on there because the way it's designed, uh, the taper, if you had NACs on there, there's a chance it could slip. You don't want it to slip, so you definitely wouldn't use it there. But if you come over here to this one, which is just a standard keyed connection, you may want to put a little bit on there too. So depends on the situation. We'll cover some more anesthes over there, but it is depending on the type of shaft locking device you're using. Okay, great. And then um, you mentioned about preloading. So is there a spot to find preload rating? Uh, preloading is, it's really dependent on the bearing. Yep. Uh, certain bearings can take amount, a certain amount of misalignment. And that's kind of related to the manufacturer's preload rating, as you say. Um, it's more so the alignment of the bearing before you prevent preload. Preload is just a, a phenomenon that happens when you're loading the bearing before it's doing anything, hence preloading. Gotcha. It's not okay. really a rating per se. And then the, the last question, and this is actually my question is, you mentioned <laughs> soft foot. Yep. Um, can you talk a little bit more about soft foot? Because I know we hear that a lot and just yep. make sure that everybody soft understands foot, what that is. That, that's the industry term for soft foot. Um, the, uh, kind of reiterating what, reiterating what I said before, it's if you have, say you have four points of mounting. So if you picture this box is upside down, you have one, two, three, four points of mounting. If for whatever reason, the surface that it's mounted to isn't completely flat or it's not machined flat or somebody put a spacer on or whatever, the, or the floor isn't level if it's right to the floor, that one spot will be higher than the other. And what that happens, so if you're like this and th this one is low, the unit will want to rock this way. So that's soft, meaning it's soft in that one corner on that one foot. So that's what it comes from. But you want to avoid that at all costs. Okay, perfect. No other questions right no, now. No, okay. All right. 
what we're going to do now, we're going to switch over here for a little bit. We're going to go through some of our mounting. First, we'll start with the relatively easiest one. This is our uh, cup. This will cover a few different mounting styles. So we have both easy grip and shrink disc uh, installation. So shrink disc, this is the actual shrink disc itself. This is what the part is called, is shrink disc. Uh, the way it works is you have two plates. Hopefully you can see that okay. You have two plates and when you tighten these together, they squeeze together. And the inside plate here, if you can see, there's a split. So when you squeeze this together, there's a taper on the back side of this. When you squeeze this, if you can see that gap, it'll close. So when it's closing, it is now clamping on the shaft of the unit, therefore crushing this onto your pulley shaft. So for shrink disc installation, you'll put the, this isn't exactly one, but we'll, we'll just cover the, the concept here. You would put it over the outside of the reducer, the output shaft of the reducer, center it on there, slide it onto the shaft, and then you tighten it down in a circular pattern. Now, this one is crucial that you do circular pattern because they're so close together. Uh, when we cover this, we'll switch to a different pattern, but for a string disc, it's always in a circular pattern and you make sure they're uh, to the final torque in three steps. Once you hit that final torque, this, this, the shaft is now crushed onto the pulley and you're good to go. To remove those, you just unscrew all the bolts. It may take some prying on the two halves of the shrink disc, but once it's released, the shrink disc comes off and you can slide the reducer right off. So pretty simple uh, to, to remove. In both of these cases, you do not, both shrink disc and easy grip, you do not want any seats. Both the internal bore and the shaft have to be clean and dry, usually degreased, clean and dry, making sure there's nothing in there. If you do use anything like that, it will start slipping and you lose your torque transmission. So make sure they're clean. Now we'll switch over to easy grip. So easy grip uses the same shrink disc, but it's a little bit different on the inside. So here's the components that come in an easy grip kit. So the shrink disc, as we just discussed, we have an inner support bushing that has this built-in locking collar and we have our outer support bushing. So the way this works, we have our little cutaway test shaft here. Take the inner support bushing, slide it on to the shaft all the way in. Then you take, we'll take the reducer up front here just to make it a little heavy. So we'll keep it simple to see here, but we'll keep all our parts. We'll slide the unit onto the shaft, lining up. If you can see the back side here, we lined it up over the inner bushing that we put in. Put that all the way in. Then we take our outer support bushing on there, slide that onto the shaft so it lines up. A little bit of a burr there. There we go. So that's all the way in. You can see both bushings are inside like this. Once that's in, you take your shrink disc, slide it over, get it centered on the extension and you tighten it the same way. So now with that, it's working the same way as a shrink disc, but the main difference with an easy grip is if you ever needed to change the shaft that it's on, or if you needed to have one reducer that covered multiple applications. So say you have two applications, same reducer, but they have a different shaft, what do you do? So if this is your other application, all you have to do is get another set of bushings. These are, these are just for display here, but just change the bushings, put it on there and mount it the same way. The reducer does not change. All that changes are these bushings. So it makes it very flexible for different types of shafts or different type of inventory. As, as Phil mentioned, uh, inventory optimization and uh, asset management, things like that. One reducer to cover multiple applications with just changing some bushings is a lot easier. So that's easy grip and shrink disc. So we'll slide that out of the way. Hey, Adam, can I ask a question real quick? Sure. So any benefits to one or the other, like a standard shrink disc or what we have in the easy grip? Um, uh, just from the uh, inventory uh, standpoint, the easy grip covers more applications with one reducer. Uh, shrink disc is a little bit more specific because the shaft, the, the hub of the reducer is the same, um, or you have to change it for the different size shaft. So it all comes down to preference there, but easy grip is a little bit more flexible. Gotcha. For different shaft sizes. And then do you have to have any special machine shafts when you're using something like an easy grip or a shrink disc? Easy grip, it's not as, uh, you do have to have it hit the right the shaft diameter, but the tolerance on easy grip is not as crucial. Shrink disc, it is fairly crucial because you have to make sure the, uh, if I pull this out again, just to show. 
just to make sure this shaft extension here where the shrink disc goes, if your shaft is too small, it won't crush enough and transmit the torque. So on a shrink, on a shrink disc version only, not easy grip, the shaft tolerance has to be pretty crucial. But we don't have to machine a special step in the shaft. No, no, like no step. Cool. It just can be a straight through like that, just a straight, straight Perfect. shaft. Yep. Great. Awesome. Oh, good on there. Okay, no good more questions. <laughs> All right, so that's easy grip and shrink disc. So now we'll switch over to taper grip bushing. So this is probably the most common question I get is how to install one of these properly and how to remove them as well. So we'll cover that today. So first, this is how the reducer comes in the box. We always thread the taper grip bushing in before we ship it. So the first thing to do is when you, you have it on your workbench here, you're getting ready to install it. You're going to unscrew the taper grip bushing all the way out. So there's your bushing, here's your parts. You have a thrust collar, you have the hardware on the front. Make sure this is down. You make sure all your screws in there are, are in and loose so they're not, so that sits nice and flat there. And the first thing you wanna do is now, this is where we do use anti-seize. So we just take some standard anti-seize and just take a little bit, does not take a lot. Take a little bit and a little bit right on the end right here. That's about all you need. Once that's on there, we can get this out of the way. Put a little bit on the end, if you can see that, and then you take it right here and you thread it in. Just like a normal screw, you thread it all the way in until it stops. So now that's all the way in. Now you take your a, a shim. So we use a feeler gauge or this is a one millimeter spacer that we had. You come back here, uh, well, we'll show this in a little bit more detail here in a second, but here's where you initially set your gap. You set the gap. Now this is the most important step right here and we'll show it uh, when we switch over to here. But once you set that gap, you get it roughly, it's usually about a half a turn out uh, from all the way in. So you set your gap and you're good there. So now the table grip bushing is ready to go onto the shaft. So we'll transition over to here real quick. Um, any questions come up while we're before we switch to that? So far, so good. So, like I say, the gap we'll, we'll show here in a second. We just got to switch cameras just a quick second. But the gap is the most critical uh, step in this taper grip bushing. If you do not set this gap correctly, it, it'll transmit the torque, okay, but it, the capacity is not the same, and it also will uh, be a pain to remove. You won't be able to remove it to the point where it's stuck on the shaft. In some cases you have to cut the shaft or even uh, destroy the gearbox just to remove it. So we wanna make sure that you set that gap correctly. So let me tighten this up before we make a mess with any seats. Okay, so now we can switch over here to this unit here. Now in the sake of time, we're not doing with the crane uh, to, to mount it. So we have the reducer on here. One crucial thing before you slide it onto the shaft is to make sure that the shaft itself, so if we have, let me grab this fast, this is where it's our shaft clean, completely cleaned and dry on this shaft to make sure if it has anything on it, you'll have issues with slipping, things like that. So make sure it's clean and dry. So once it's clean and dry, you slide it onto the shaft. And the next is we're gonna confirm that, that gap. So Phil, if you can get in close here, this is where we're checking that gap. This is where we checked it over on the bench. We wanna make sure this is where the gap. So it's between the plate, the thrust plate, and the back side of that front flange. So our gap is good. We're in the right position. The table grip bushing is in the right position, and we're good to go. Now, once it's in the right position on the shaft, you're going to uh, tighten down the torque arm. Now, with these torque arms, um, there's there's rubber bushing kits. I can show you here. These are the kits that we ship with the reducers. There's two rubber bushings, washers. Uh, the bolt does not come with it because we don't necessarily know how thick the piece of equipment is uh, that you were bolting it to. So we wanna make sure to, or that you would order your right size bolt. So once you have all the components there, uh, you wanna tighten it down through the, through the torque arm, through your piece of equipment, tighten it down so that you can spin at least one of the bushings that we sent. If it's too tight where you can't spin any of them, then the, the reducer can't float. And the idea with these shaft mounted reducers, now this is for everybody's, these reducers have to be able to move with the run out of the shaft. 
So these shafts, they're, they're never perfect. They, they're, they're very easy to get bent in transit or different situations. So when the shafts are that way, they tend to bend and the reducer will tend to wobble. You can see it way out here when it's running. The reducer tends to wobble, like, kind of like a wave, just like this. So we want to make sure that the reducer is allowed to do that. If you tighten it down so much that it doesn't wobble, it'll fail the seals and then it'll fail the outboard bearings as well. So we definitely want to make sure that you let the reducer float with the run out of the shaft. So as long as you can turn one of the rubber bushings uh, on the torque arm set, you're good to go. So now we know the torque arm is bolted down. We know that it's in the right position. Our gap is still good. We can go around and tighten these bolts. So with the torque wrench set to the spec uh, of the reducer, the, say the reducer the spec is 200 foot pounds. You want to break that down into three steps, very similar as we did with the easy grip. So if we do, if it's 200, we'll do 80, uh, 150, and then 200. So we'll do 80 on this one. We'll set this one to 80. You'll come around, tighten down. And this one you do do in a star pattern. So we come all the way around, star pattern all the way through. Once you get them started, and then you go through with the torque wrench, get them to click all the way around. So the torque wrench will click and then you're good. So you get the three steps right to your final torque. You now know it's torqued down. Now to remove it, to remove the taper grip bushing, assuming the gap was set correctly now, this is 100% of the gap was set correct. To remove it, you loosen up your, your bolts, all six of them, you get them completely loose. So there, you can see the plates start to move again. So now these are all loose, ready to go. Now you take a uh, brass hammer or anything you have, you wanna punch it in this direction. Not the shaft itself, but the outside edge of the bushing. When you do that, it allows the bushing to go in and then it releases the taper. If I show one of our little spares here, this is our taper grip bushing to remove. You can see the, the split here. What happens is when you're shoving it back in, these threads on here are allowing that split to open back up and not clamp on the shaft anymore. So that's how the taper grip bushing is working. If it can't go in, if you didn't set that gap, it can't go in, it can't release, it is not coming off. So that gap is very important. Now, hey, just a, yep, a couple questions here. So uh, first question, when you were performing the installation, does the shaft have to engage fully with the, the bushing? <laughs> Yes, so we have a, or one of the dimensions we, call, we refer to in our catalog as our TT dimension. So our TT dimension is the dimension through the shaft, through the reducer, how far it comes through. Now shown here, the, this shaft is right flush on the end. This is ideal. You want it to come through that far. Um, when it comes through that far, you know you're getting full torque transmission. So that's all frame size, frame, uh, frame size dependent on your gearbox. So once you have that frame size determined from our selection process, we now know how long of a shaft we need. Now, for whatever, if, if you run into a situation where the shaft is a little bit too small, you have a bigger unit, you just don't have enough, that's where this one comes in. This is our extended taper grip bushing. So uh, if you remember how short this, the other one only went to about here. So now you can have this same box mounted a little further out mm. because the shaft is a little shorter. So uh, it's definitely a good option if you have a, for a retrofit application where you can't change the shaft, you don't have the time to change the shaft, just change the bushing and it'll be, it'll accommodate that shorter mm. shaft. Perfect. And then when you were performing the, the tip of grip bushing screw in there before you put a little anti-seize on there, mm -hmm. does that help when you're, when you're removing it? I mean, you're hitting the, the end of that tip of grip bushing. Right. So what the, right? the anti-seize does, when metal, when metal is in contact like this in these applications, the metal on a microscopic level, the metal is moving this like this back and forth. When that happens, you get, I call it, they call it rust. It's not really rust. It's fretting is the, is the term. It's fretting corrosion. And when that happens over time, it could essentially weld it together uh, for lack of a better term, but it would be stuck together and having the anesthes on there prevents that from happening. Gotcha. And then I, I noticed the torque arms. We, we talked a little bit about torque arms, but a uh, little bit different style torque arm that we've got here mounted with this BBB. What's the, the difference? Uh, the main difference is how it mounts to the BBB itself. So we have our banjo style torque arm. It's more of a, a flush mount torque arm. Uh, we have our T-type torque arm as well. That it mounts to the same side, uses slightly different hardware. 
Um, slightly different. Uh, this one here, let me just I'll grab this off camera real fast. This is our, our turnbuckle style here. This mounts to that, that corner. This would go to the piece of equipment on the floor, uh, however you wanted to do it. But the, the concepts remain the same as far as shaft float and having the reducer being able to move. Just slightly different designs. Perfect. All righty. So that's taper grip bushing. That's that torque arm. So lastly, we want to cover uh, keyed hollow bore. So this is probably one of the more common uh, installation types. So again, in the sake of time, we, we've had it pre-mounted here. But you can see here, uh, the shaft is there. Our key, our shaft key is, uh, is matched up. We have the key stock in there. Uh, torque arm, same concept as over there. We make sure that the rubber bushings, we can turn them. We don't want it to be too tight for the same reasons I mentioned before. With the shaft drilled and tapped, we have a basically a big metal washer, but we call it a keeper plate. Then with the bolt through it, you usually put a little bit of Loctite on there to keep this out. Keyed hollow bore, you do want um, anti-seize on. So you coat the shaft when, before you slide it on there. Then you put this bolt on there, tighten that down, get that tight with the appropriate wrench here. There you go. So now that keeps that reducer from falling off the shaft. So now that's permanently on there. You would snap on your low speed cover. You're good to go. Now, again, when you, after you mount all these, you're going to start them up and you're going to watch them. So usually you'll see the reducer do one of these. It'll bounce up and down a little bit, very slowly, very smooth. Uh, but other than that, if there's no chunking, there's no banging, there's nothing hitting the reducer or the motor or the torque arm, when it's doing its floating action, then you're good. If there is, you wanna go in and trim some of the metal away on the conveyor side, obviously not the reducer side. You're gonna trim some of that away, make sure nothing's hitting, make sure it can free float completely. So once everything's checked out like that, your reducer is fully installed, ready to go. So that covers the majority of our installations. I guess we'll leave up time for some questions or do you have a question? <laughs> what uh what what if the the shaft is is not drilled and tapped i mean you, you installed the the keeper plate there but yeah uh, other versions of not drilled and tapped we can use shaft locking collars uh they're they're similar to this it doesn't have this bushing on the end it's just that portion of the locking collar it's basically a clamp that goes onto the shaft the reducer sits up against that and you could tighten another one on the outside to keep it from falling off gotcha okay couple different versions. And then we talked a little bit about uh, the different styles of torque arms, but uh, is one better than the other when it comes to different applications, maybe starts and stops or reversing applications? Right, right. So starts and stops, the uh, Banjo or our T-type style are probably the best because they cover both directions. Uh, this version here, this needs to be mounted in uh, tension, meaning it has to be pulling apart if it goes in compression. Uh, some of the older designs, they would literally collapse on themselves. These don't do that as much, but these, you still want them in tension because of their design, they could fail over time. So keep that in mind when you're doing a reversing applications, other things have to change because the loading goes in both directions versus just one as well. So you have to keep that in mind. Gotcha. Okay. Anything else? I think that was it. <laughs> well, uh, we've covered a lot. Um, we are going to see if we have any questions. Go to the panel here. Uh, no questions so far, looks like. Um, we will hang around for just a few minutes as we always do after each webinar and give you an opportunity to ask any questions. Um, if you don't have any questions, we will bid you farewell and say thank you. Again, we're going to send this video out after, as we do with all of our webinars, we'll send it out in our follow-up email. You can also find all of our videos on YouTube. So feel free to like and subscribe. We would appreciate that. All of the, uh, the videos that we've done are out there. So great resources for you. And uh, we'll continue to put more of this content out there. Uh, for any of you on the phone, uh, obviously that are in the United States, feel free to reach out to your local sales representatives. You can find those on our website at sumitomodrive.com. Anybody in any other country as well, uh, all of your local sales rep or facility contact information can be found on our website. So feel free to go there and, and find any of that information. Uh, looks like we do have a question here. So go to the questions. If I have a problem with installation, can I call you? 
<laughs> sure. <laughs> you can call me. You can call any of our field guys too. Our, our sales, our sales team is very knowledgeable in these installations as well. Um, but yeah, feel free to call any of us. We can definitely help you out. Yeah. And that's a, that's a great point. I mean, uh, Sumitomo Drop Technologies is a global company. We've got facilities all across the world. Uh, we've got service facilities, mm -hmm. uh, service that techs. That specifically do that type of thing. That specifically do installs. Yep. Uh, we can do retrofits, repairs, mm -hmm. infield repairs. Uh, so we've got a plethora of resources at your disposal. So feel free to call us. We'd love you to. <laughs> Let's see. Do we have any other questions? Okay. No other questions like so far. So again, uh, appreciate your time. Look for this video to come out afterwards, a recording. And uh, find us on YouTube and please like and subscribe. We'll hang out for a little bit. We'll hang out for just a few minutes. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you.